Hi, Bill Yannick here, Connects with MCO. Welcome to the Daily Grind, a very special Daily Grind as we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we have our subject matter expert and one of our partners through Connects FM. She's Sherry Darden, the person who needs no introduction. She is CEO and founder of Kersby. Can I run something by you? I've only done that introduction now about 30 times. So I got it right, Sherry. Welcome to the Daily Grind. Thank you, Bill. As, um, it's a pleasure, as always, to be here talking with you today. Well, this is cool. Normally, we have a third guest. You're the guest today. It's just going to be a discussion yeah. between two of us. So in honor of that, let's start with an introduction of you and Kersby. What do you do? What is that all about? Okay, again, like you said, it runs, it stands for Can I Run Something by You? And I call myself a CEO growth strategist where I support the top. You know, many times as CEOs or people in the C suite, um, they're kind of assumed that they know everything, they've got everything together, and they don't need support. And so I just kind of come in and, and help them support and help them positively impact their bottom line. Um, like with you coming in supporting with DEI committees. DEI initiatives, training, anything that I can do to support an organization to be the best that they can be by supporting the C-suite. Fantastic. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and day. So let's start with his role in the Civil Rights Act and Civil Rights Movement and, uh, and even dealing with protected classes and the like. What was his role and, and how did he lead that? Well, I think if if nobody knows anything, they always think about Martin Luther King and he had the the wonderful I have a dream speech and all that good stuff. And his dream was for equality. And mm -hmm. so back in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed with President Lyndon B. Johnson at the time. At that time, Bill, the Civil Rights Act had four pillars. And I always like to call it, it was kind of like the, the foundation. You know, you need those four legs to, to create a firm foundation. And when we think about those four pillars, it was to end discrimination based on race, color, religion, and national origin. Sometimes the, those lines get blurred, but that was the original intent. And so the Civil Rights Act was to outlaw the discrimination based on those. And it really had to do with employment, mm -hmm. voting act rights, and then public facilities. You know, again, the, the separate restrooms and the separate bathrooms and education. You know, we've got Brown versus the Board of Education, those kinds of things. So that was the, the firm foundation of that. And so when you asked about that, that was the start back in 1964. And then since then, when you talked about the protected classes, we still have those four, but we added five others. Most times people think it's only seven, it's nine. So it's nine. So we talked about the race, color, religion, and national origin. We have now added on sex, veterans, disabilities, age, and then the most recent one that was enacted back in the 1990s was genetic information. So if you look at that, he was very pivotal, pivotal, <laughs> pivotal in creating equality for everybody. Because if you think about it, everyone falls into one of those categories. And when we talk about age, it's the protected act, to the protected class of those that are 40 years of age or older. So I always tell everybody, if you're not in a class yet, wait until you hit your 40th birthday and you'll be included. So he was very pivotal in that. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, next thing I wanna talk a little bit about is the workplace and an equitable environment, workplace environment, and especially, and it, it rings home true, if you're a non-minority leader of a workplace environment, um, what are some considerations that he or she, or he in particular, ought to be thinking about when leading an organization? Um, I think step one is to bring everyone to the table. You've heard my analogy of the Thanksgiving table and just allowing everyone a space at the table. That's step one. And that's where many do, many don't, but many do. But there's an extra step in that bill. And what that means is it's not enough just to invite me to the table create an environment which in which I can thrive. Now, uh, my first degree is in accounting and I know it's gonna sound really logical, but my um, internship in college was air traffic control. 
Yeah, no, that's logical, right? Air traffic control and accounting. Oh, wow. I didn't know that about you. I learned something there. Okay. <laughs> they, right. they both start with A. And so my mentor was the first African-American woman who was an air traffic controller. And I don't know if you remember, there was a certain, uh, I can just say it because it's not anything. Reagan fired all of the union yep. air traffic controllers. Yeah, and, I'm old enough to remember that. <laughs> yeah, yes. So am I. I'm old enough to live through it. So that was one of those situations where they took the opportunity at that time to say, hey, you know what? This is an industry that is um, very homogenous, if you will. And so it was an opportunity for them to recruit people of color and women. Well, I was ding, 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 because I was both. And so, but what I found at that time was it wasn't enough just to bring me there. So they brought me there. I did the internship, you know, went down to Mike Maroney Aeronautical Center in Oklahoma City, but it wasn't a great environment for me to flourish. So therefore I left. So when we think about that nine minority, it's great to bring someone to the table, but we want to also to create an environment in which they can flourish. Um, I'm working with an attorney now and um, on something separate, but she shared her experience. And these are things like, making sure that we're privy to the meetings. So don't have a meeting before the meeting. And then when I come to the meeting, you've everything's already been decided. Yep. Because that's kind of, and I don't want to say tokenism because that's a different thing, but it's just kind of kind of going through the motions. We we have our prop here and to sit, smile and be and be nice, which is kind of some things that women have to go through. So I would say that step one, give us a space at the table. Step two, create an environment in which we can contribute because we have a lot to contribute. So I would say that. Interesting. Okay. So um, maybe dig in a little bit more, more specific to Connects FM, because when we started working together, one of the issues, and we still have it at Connects FM, is dealing with Black-owned vendors, Black black business partners, and, and how to bolster that or mm -hmm. increase those relationships. What are your thoughts on how we can continue to do that? Um, I think, I think, one, giving opportunity. Um, just, just making the effort of giving opportunity. So if someone knocks at the door and says, hey, I'd like to do work with you, is give them the opportunity. The other thing I would say is um, in, in ways of historically, because we've not been available to, to afford those opportunities. So maybe we aren't as big. Mm -hmm. Allow or require subcontracting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, many of your um, your members have government contracts. And that's part of the requirement of government contracts. And I also too want to say to kind of piggyback on ESG, you know, it's it's a it's going to be a requirement. That is something that you know was kind of a nice to have, or we don't know what those acronyms mean, but it is actually bringing things to the table. The other thing I would also too say is work and advertise and interact in areas maybe you haven't before. And what I mean by that is maybe the US Black Chamber or a local Black Chamber or local Black associations. I remember uh, my brother belonged to a Black Data Processing Association or uh, the National Association of African-American Human Resources Professionals if they're looking for outsourcing. So kind of look at those places. And in addition, Bill, not just Black, but those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to sit at that big table are, and I'm going to date myself by saying this, our VOTEC, our vocational technical places, which, whether it's through a high school or a community college, all of those things. So I would just say widen your horizon as to where you go to solicit for vendors. Awesome. Well, earlier we talked about older, I won't call myself old, but older non-minority <laughs> leaders in the workplace. So let's talk about Another uh, area where there are some challenges in the workplace, Black women in the workplace. And so uh, what are your thoughts? What are some of the unique challenges that they face and how can a, an organization, I guess, maybe facilitate a better environment and, and help that? Um, embrace the difference. Um, this kind of brings me back to when I met you, Bill. Um, you brought me in when you had that revelation, and I always commend you and will continue to. So if I embarrass you, forgive me, because I'm going to continue to embarrass you for, for taking that initiative to say, hey, um, I know I need to do something and let me actually do it and not necessarily check the box. And so when we were having the conversation with your staff, 
one of the things that I brought up was the Crown Act. And unfortunately, we have most of our states that control how a Black woman wears her hair. Huh. Okay. They control and they say, well, we don't quite like how God made the hair come out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm I'm giving my hair a rest here a little bit, but you know, for for probably almost a year and a half, two years with you, I've worn locks, which is a natural style for Black women, and dress coats. So yes, Sherry, you're qualified. We love to have you. However, you're going to have to straighten your hair, or you're going to have to wear hair that is less distracting. So that would be one of those things is to give that opportunity. The other thing I would say is, and, and I have been accused of this and I've become okay with it is when as a black woman, if I'm passionate about something or I stand my ground on something, I become a quote unquote angry black woman. Whereas other ethnicities are, well, that's, it's because they're of this ethnic group and they're passionate well, why can't I be passionate as well? And so sometimes those are the um, those are the, the the struggles that we have. And I would just say embrace it and embrace it. Um, I don't know if anybody watches Trevor Noah. You know, he just left the Daily the Nightly Show or whatever that show was, and and he gave homage to um, you know black women having to be resourceful. You know, I, I call myself the the black female MacGyver. <laughs> You know, because of society, I've had to learn how to make things work and do things simultaneously. So if you hire a Black woman, you've got someone who is very resourceful out of necessity that can actually come in and bring that resourcefulness to your organization. And so I would just say that. And the last thing I would say is not necessarily just Black women, uh, Black people, but Black women as well, too, is what's called code switching. And there's lots of terms that are out there. And code switching simply means is I talk one way with a, a, a familiar group, but when it's time to get into the boardroom and those types of things, I am required to speak in my vernacular and my enunciation and my uh, my actions in a different way. And that's called code switching. And so you know, I would just say is if we allow one group to be themselves, then we want to allow Black women to be themselves as well. And that would be a great place as well, too, to, to add and to start. Interesting. but Very yeah. interesting stuff. Okay. So we, we heard a little bit about your career, uh, the air traffic control angle, which I actually hadn't heard before, but you're yeah. obviously an entrepreneur and you've had a journey as a female entrepreneur, which is somewhat unique, hopefully not as unique as it, as it used to be, but <laughs> So what's been your journey, some of the challenges, some of the interesting things along your path? Um, I think I think it's one of the things, and again, when when uh, I, I met you and your your staff, I'm, what almost be three years, I guess, this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, time has gone by, is the surprise that we still have in society of a black woman a Black person or Black entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about, and, and so, you know, one of my um, diversity workshops that I do is called What You Said, What You Said Is Not What I Heard. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when someone comes up to me and they're still surprised that I can be articulate and I can use three and four, or sometimes five syllable words with a struggle, <laughs> but, but, but I can get it out. And it's sometimes, again, it's the surprise um, of the ability to be an entrepreneur, to be at the table, to really contribute with really good ideas and be okay with it, mm -hmm. be okay with it. So again, going back to the original 1964 Civil Rights Act, did you notice the four pillars had nothing to do with sex? Because it was really about men still. So it wasn't until later that the protected class came with women. So there is still that struggle of, okay, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little older, so I don't get the, you know, she, she's cute kind of thing, but you know, someone who, you know, they're sometimes looking at the outside and not necessarily look at the inside with that assumption of if she's black, if she's female, it, it's going to be a challenge to work with her when it's not. So it, it's it's still, it's still, you know, I still get the questions of, oh, well, you know, what's your education? Or, oh, that's so surprising. I had a young lady that I worked with 
in the city of Fort Worth um, doing some entrepreneur curriculum. And uh, we were sharing about ourselves and we were talking about different target markets. And I shared about my background and my parents, both my parents were, you know, you and I talked about my dad getting his, his master's at K-State and all that good stuff. And three years working with her bill, every time I told that story, her response was still the same, that she just couldn't believe that I grew up with two parents, educated parents, you know, not the Huxtables, but, you know, something similar to that. So that it can still be a challenge, you know, that we are sometimes we can still be conceived or, or perceived as a, a novelty. Obviously. Yeah. Well, and definitely work to be done and learning to continue yeah. as we will on the daily grind and working with you, Sherry. Thanks again. Thank you. Certainly today as our guest with all the insight, a fascinating interview, and we look forward to, we'll have you on the daily grind again. I have a yes. feeling. <laughs> Probably next month. But for all yeah. out there, that's your Martin Luther King Jr. Daily Grind. Thank you for joining us. We're here at 2 Central every day or at connectsfm.com. Have a good one.